Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I, I asked uh, Matt Frank, I said, do we have a crowd? He says, we've got so many people that are even sitting next to each other. Usually, that's, <laughs> that is usually the sign that we've got a crowd here. We're, we're glad to have everybody here today. This is a very important opportunity. We, we're delighted to have Tanaka-san back with us. He's a, a good friend, uh, both personally and professionally. We welcome these opportunities to highlight his work. You know, the World Energy Outlook is one of the most important documents that not just here in Washington but around the world we all wait for it to see and give us guidance how to think our way through the future. I mean, this is a, we're, we're really struggling here. I mean, we've got, uh, we're in the middle of a great debate, we're in the middle of a great recession, uh, we're trying to find our our way forward in both of these dimensions and, and and we do have a very strong impulse to try to do something about the environment but people don't want to wreck the economy in the process and how are we going to integrate all of that and uh, we've got people with an enormous amount of passion and probably not enough knowledge and uh, that's Washington okay I mean that's you know we uh, and so what we do is we seek opportunities like this to where we can actually put knowledge on the table. People can still hold their passionate views, but let's just step back a moment and ground it on facts and ground it on perspective, disciplined forecasting. And I think that's what we've all come to see and expect and admire from, uh, from Tanaka-san and from the International Energy Agency. So we're delighted to welcome him. Uh, David Pumphrey is really going to lead this. I'm here just for uh, ornament, ornamental reasons uh, to say thank you for coming. Glad you're here. Welcome our friends back, and we look forward to this very insightful presentation. David, let's why don't we start for real. Thanks, John. Um, I think actually I'm here more for ornamental purposes. Uh, John's always the, the star here. And I've also learned something uh, that whenever we give him a piece of paper to read from, we can never know exactly what he's going to say. So uh, <laughs> thanks, John. Um, it, it is truly a great honor to have um, really the senior most uh, representatives of the International Energy Agency here this afternoon to talk about this very timely uh, publication on this World Energy Outlook uh, 2009. We're just about to engage in the Copenhagen round, the long-awaited Copenhagen round of negotiations to try to set an international framework. And I think having this document on the table is really uh, critical to start understanding the scale of the task facing us if we want to actually get our emissions levels down to the level that science is saying we need to to avoid catastrophic change. And I think that the scenarios laid out in this report are really helpful in understanding that. But I think also it takes us back and reminds us that energy security is a continuing concern. We will have a transition period that we have to deal with. And I think, again, the, this outlook will uh, be very helpful in uh, providing us that information. We've uh, passed out uh, some of the biographies, so I won't go through the biographies in great detail. Um, Executive Director Tanaka has been with the IEA for two years now and I think has really begun to make his mark on the organization. And I, he will be, I think, leading the presentation to start it off. Um, I think he'll be followed, if I understand it right, correctly, by uh, Dr. Fatih Barol, who's the chief economist and the director of the office. And Fatih, I think, may have the distinction of serving almost the longest of anybody in the IEA. I'm not sure, but it's pretty close. And I think that's a testament to his skills. And then the newest member of the team is uh, Deputy Director uh, uh, Dick Jones, who's uh, been there about one year and is filling this uh, role coming from a long career in the U.S. Uh, Foreign Service. So no further ado, uh, sure. Tanaka-san. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, John, uh, for giving us an opportunity to talk all of you and uh, old good friends and new good friends all over here. And I'm really delighted to come back to CSIS to make this World Energy Outlook 2009. You may have heard many things about uh, this World Energy Outlook. Yes, uh, this time we have released uh, about a month ago to the climate change negotiators in Thailand the special excerpt for the climate change chapters of this World Energy Outlook. Because this year we made uh, a slightly different configuration that we did country by country data and region by region analysis available for the negotiators because this gives a very good benchmark for, uh, say, the climate change negotiation. 
Uh, we have the technologies necessary for the region of our country or the what m amount of the money necessary for the investment. So this gives a very interesting insight for the negotiators. So this document, World Energy Outlook, has been a kind of Bible for the energy policy maker, but now it's a Bible for climate change negotiators. You, we are very happy to, 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 to uh, to be in such kind of uh, situation and help the Copenhagen negotiation. Um, and also it is very important that the United States has certainly a central role for to play. And uh, in this regard, uh, we have very much welcomed the recent announcement that the United States is going to uh, make the key step toward the mitigation of uh, CO2 emission by announcing the targets for 2020. Well, Fatih will explain our view about that. Certainly 17% is very close to our number, very in line with our 450 scenario, which uh, analyzed that maybe 18% um, compared to the 17% is, is necessary, but it's very close. And one after another, the new uh, targets are publicized by different countries, and uh, they are almost in line with what we are saying. China has recently announced the intensity of the CO2 emission over GDP, re uh, improving it by 40%, 45%. It is very close to what we are prescribing. So that's, another, again, uh, Fatih will explain to you. So. We are thinking that uh, this 450 scenario, well, we call it 450-150. He will tell you why this is 450-150, but uh, certainly is a very interesting benchmark for the negotiators. But we are making this World Energy Outlook not only for the climate change negotiators, because if 450-150 happens, that it has a huge impact for the energy market and enhance energy security. So that is the reason why the IEA is so interested and very much enthusiastic about this scenario. We found many interesting new discoveries in, in the 450, which he will tell you about. And in the gas sector, in the nuclear sector, this is the new uh, Bible for everybody. And uh, I wish also this uh, outlook is the baby of Fatih Biro, the baby is getting bigger and bigger, more famous and more famous, and more relevant and more relevant. That's what I, we want to see happen. And uh, I am very much delighted, all of you here, and to join us of uh, this interesting uh, document uh, launching in the Washington DC. Thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, also, my thanks go to CSIS for hosting us uh, one more time. I think if I am not wrong, this is the fourth or fifth time in, in a row. And uh, we always, in our presentations, in our work, always gave very alarming, very uh, pessimistic messages. But this time, I, we will give some a uh, couple of uh, good messages, some good news, so it is very rare. And uh, some of the good news are related to the United States, which is even more rare. So this is uh, this, uh, what you will see uh, when we go through. Now, um, as Mr. Tanaka said, uh, I am going to uh, describe two different words to you, energy words. One of them is an energy word without a climate deal, and the other one is an energy world with a climate deal. And uh, a big portion of this uh, work this year was looking at what we need to do in the energy sector in order to limit the carbon dioxide emissions so that the global temperature increases only uh, uh, two degrees. This was, the, we call it the 450 uh, scenario. But also, also, I will start with a presentation by showing uh, you our reference scenario, what happens if there is no deal in Copenhagen or beyond, which brings the, uh, our world 
to a up to six degrees increase in the temperature. So, so two different worlds and two different energy uh, uh, sectors. Let me start with the reference scenario, <clears throat> which means no changes in the, in the uh, uh, policies. Couple of remarks. One, the almost all the growth in the global energy demand comes outside of the OECD region. And China alone is responsible more than 40% of the growth in the global energy demand. Highlighting the key factor, uh, China, highlighting the, the importance of any decision taken or not taken in China for the rest of the world. OECD countries uh, reach a peak in terms of uh, oil demand. In the year 2007, they were consuming about uh, almost 50 million barrels per day of oil. And as of uh, 2010, we expect uh, this to come down about 45.5 million barrels per day. And we expect this trend, the OECD uh, uh, oil demand trend, with some zigzags, will continue. And the, we will not see the days of 2006-2007 uh, again. Also in terms of coal, the OECD use has peaked. And oil demand uh, will come again uh, mainly from China, Middle East countries, the producing countries themselves, and, and India. And again, with the current policies in place, they may reach around 105 million barrels per day in 2030. So while the demand uh, context is well known and well studied, and the numbers uh, coming from different organizations, in, including the uh, EIA, are more or less similar. We wanted to see whether or not the supply side is uh, ready enough, fit enough to answer this uh, uh, demand. A key worry we have is on the uh, investment side. You may remember that last year when we were here, one of the final um, uh, uh, messages uh, we tried to leave you with was uh, 2008 onwards, we would like to see uh, oil investments to increase in order to uh, meet the growth in the demand and address the decline of oil production issue. And uh, we asked for an increase, and uh, what we have found out is a significant uh, decrease in 2009. So we expect that the investments uh, on the supply side will go down about 19 percent, mainly as a result of financial crisis, uh, but still a significant uh, decline. And talking with the companies in the last couple of months, it will be difficult to believe that the, there will be a major rebound in 2010. So our worry here is that with the, this, if this trend continues, the, the decline in investments, and if it marries <coughs> with a strong rebound in the uh, oil demand, with the recovery of the economy, this may well have implications on the uh, oil prices, uh, pushing them up, and higher prices than uh, these levels we have may be rather problematic for the uh, um, economic recovery, which is and which will be still fragile in the next quarters uh, to come. Another worry we have is under, uh, related to the resource uh, uh, basis. We think that the, uh, the oil fields, uh, many of the mature fields are in a decline, significant decline, and uh, uh, to compensate the decline in these mature fields is a major task in itself. Even if we assume, we don't, nobody knows how much the oil demand will increase, even if we assume that the global oil demand between now and 2030 would be flat, so today we have about 85 million barrels per day, even in 2030, oil demand was again 85 million barrels per day. In order to meet the decline or offset the decline in the existing fields, we have to find and develop uh, about 45 million barrels per day of new oil, which means bringing four new Saudi Arabias in the picture. And this has uh, several uh, challenges, poses several challenges, ranging from the investment to geology, from geology to structure of the changing structure of the oil industry and the production policies of key countries. The same issue 
uh, applies to natural gas, decline of the existing fields. In fact, in this year's outlook, in addition to climate change, we look at the gas markets uh, uh, close, as close as uh, we can. Um, what we see here is that uh, today, worldwide, we produce about uh, 3 TCM uh, gas. And as a result of decline in many countries, including Russia and Iran, two major uh, gas, uh, gas countries, uh, we think the half of the production today uh, will be lost in the next uh, 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 22 years. And uh, therefore, we have to increase the production uh, in order to A, to offset the decline, and B, to meet the growth in the demand. And here, in the context of uh, gas, uh, yeah, according to our estimates, about 60% of the uh, production in 2030 will need to come from the fields which do not uh, currently in production. A major task in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of investments and the investment uh, frameworks. Yes, good news. <clears throat> there is a silent revolution taking place in the United States. It is so silent that uh, uh, not many people uh, hear about that, especially uh, outside of the United States. We thought, but we also observed that also in the United States, it's not very well uh, known, at least perhaps beyond these circles, that there is a boom of uh, uh, unconventional gas. And this is very important, and as I will tell you in a minute, this has implications beyond the uh, United States, as much as in, in the United States. So uh, many... Uh, of us uh, thought uh, that uh, many energy experts, uh, institutions, and so on, thought that the United States, uh, a few years ago, uh, thought that the United States will need to uh, import a lot of LNG in the future in order to meet the growth in the demand and uh, in order to uh, uh, address the decline in the domestic oil, uh, domestic gas uh, pr production. But what happened? As a result of boom in the shale gas, uh, there was a big surprise. And uh, uh, based on our analysis, with a price level of $5 MBTU, and in real terms, 10% return rate, uh, we can uh, expect that the US will import a very little amount of LNG. So a big change in the picture. This is very different than, than uh, many people uh, thought. Of course, this has implications for the U.S. markets, not only for the energy sector, but also on the climate, which I, which I will come in a minute. But this has implications throughout the world. And we feel that implications already. What are those implications? <clears throat> First of all, there are many uh, companies and countries who thought that they would sell a lot of LNG to the United States and made a lot of projects, developed a lot of LNG projects. And uh, some of the projects are still continuing, but uh, there is no market in the United States to buy uh, that, uh, there's no need to buy that uh, LNG. So most of those uh, uh, countries or companies are, uh, do have or will have a lot of gas in their hands looking for uh, buyers. This is one thing. Second, in 2009, global gas demand, we expect that it will uh, decline about uh, minus 4%, a significant decline in the global gas demand. In Europe, it is even worse. We expect Europe uh, gas demand to declare minus 8, minus 9%, minus which will bring the European gas demand to the level of 1999 uh, or 2000, so 10 years back. So as a result of this decline in demand and a lot of LNG projects, uh, uh, which were taught mainly to, to send it to the United States, we see a, a, a gas glut coming. And we expected the gas glut around 2015 about 200 BCM, which is compared to uh, the last normal year we have, 2007, which is about uh, three times higher than uh, the uh, averages. And this gas glut have a lot of implications on the gas prices. So we started from the US 
shale gas boom and all the implications one by one. What are those implications? First of all, we feel, and everybody feels, of course, in the markets you know, uh, that uh, there is a downward pressure on the gas as a commodity, uh, the LNG price, and it may even getting, it may be getting stronger in the next uh, years to come. Second, uh, gas prices, which are uh, linked to uh, long-term contracts in Europe, in Asia Pacific, are going up as a result of a higher uh, uh, oil prices. And there is a growing divergence between the gas prices sold in the market and the gas prices linked uh, to uh, oil prices in the uh, long-term contracts. In Europe, just for your background, in Europe, about 75% of the trade, uh, gas trade is made on uh, long-term uh, contracts and rest uh, uh, on the uh, uh, markets. And in uh, Asia Pacific, about 55% uh, and the uh, long-term contracts. So how important it is. So we know that after our book came out, uh, uh, that uh, many uh, countries, important countries, uh, companies, knock on the door on the, of the uh, exporters and want to discuss the, 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 the terms of the uh, uh, contract, whether or not they, shouldn't they uh, reflect the market that is a bit better than uh, how they are now uh, uh, today. So uh, this is what we hear, what we read, and this is what is happening. Another uh, implication of what happened in the United States is <clears throat> a spillover effect. Uh, and I will stop the gas story uh, here by saying that. Uh, the, uh, as in other cases uh, throughout the history, the, uh, what happened in the United States gave an inspiration to the many other countries in terms of looking for unconventional gas uh, resources. And there is a growing interest in a few countries in the world, in China, in Australia, uh, in the uh, Baltic Sea, in, uh, even in, in Europe, uh, in many uh, uh, countries, and lots of uh, activities in terms of assessing the resource base, looking at the, how much uh, gas can be recovered, and there's a growing economic uh, activity in that respect. <clears throat> Let me come to another point, which uh, Mr. Tanaka already uh, highlighted, the energy security and the oil prices. The, uh, we think the oil prices in the future will be on the high side. In fact, you may remember that when we finished our presentation last year, one of the, it was in November again, it was in November at that time, and we said that the, the era of high oil prices are over. So it was uh, end of uh, November, and we went everywhere throughout the world. The more we said so, the uh, lower the prices went down. They went down to $30 and, and so on in the next weeks to come. But this was because of the financial crisis. We knew that the price will come up again, and today it is uh, uh, about $80, and we think this price level will come. Why I am saying this? Because we think the reference scenario with the current policies, oil prices, oil bills, uh, uh, may be a problem for the economies of many countries, OECD and non-OECD. This is a very simple chart, uh, what we uh, show you here. <coughs> it shows that uh, in the past, uh, for example, the United States, on average each year, paid about uh, $150 billion, on average each year, uh, oil and gas import bill. And this was, again, on average, 1% of the uh, uh, GDP. But looking at the future, we expect these shares on a, a yearly basis to increase uh, substantially, mainly as a result of higher prices. And uh, we think the, the higher prices we have seen in 2008 did uh, play an important role, not the main role, but important role in the run-up to the uh, financial crisis by uh, weakening the uh, trade balance by uh, uh, worsening the disposable household income, by uh, 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 weakening the uh, economic growth and others. And in that year, when, uh, when we had this very bad year of 2008, the ratio of, in the OECD countries, oil and gas import based to GDP was 2.3%. Uh, 
and we will have a, a, for 20 years with the current policies in place, we will have a 2% uh, uh, ratio for many years to come, which we think is an important aspect to take into consideration whether or not we should stick to current policies or change them. Another point before going to climate change I wanted to bring to your attention is a key issue uh, that you may remember that we followed in the World Energy Outlook very closely in uh, many years, in the uh, last uh, few editions, namely access to electricity in poor countries of the world. According to our analysis, uh, today 1.5 billion people in the world they have no access to electricity, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, in India, Pakistan, and in Bangladesh. This is definitely very bad news, and uh, this has many implications from small, in quote, implications to big implications. Small implications, very uh, simple, the daily implication, a mother cannot uh, keep the uh, medication for uh, her child in the refrigerator. Uh, you don't have access to any uh, uh, communication uh, uh, systems, you don't have light, and you are completely out of the uh, civilization. This is a bad news, but the worst news is, despite the economic growth we expect in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or in South Asia, in 2030, there will be still 1.3 billion people who will have no access to electricity. So therefore, we think this is a important aspect of the energy uh, discussions uh, we have, or if not, it should be an important aspect of the energy discussions uh, we have, and uh, we do not think that the markets alone can solve this problem, because bulk of the uh, uh, electricity access problem is, is in the rural areas, and what can uh, be helpful here is some international concerted uh, efforts to address this issue, and I know that Ambassador Jones have some uh, good ideas uh, how to make a move in that direction. <clears throat> so let me come to the climate change part. <clears throat> now, these trends I show you in the reference scenario brings us, as I mentioned, to an increase of the uh, global temperature up to six degrees Celsius. And energy is at the heart of this story. Energy is responsible about two thirds of the uh, emissions. So we thought we should have a, a, or design or suggest an energy system or energy revolution that would limit the increase of the temperature uh, to two degrees. And we know that uh, many countries are now ready to be a part of a deal in Copenhagen. But the only problem left is that uh, we do not know who is going to be responsible for uh, how much. This is the only small problem left. So uh, we thought uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can make a modest contribution to the solution of this uh, problem. And we uh, analyzed the current position of all the uh, countries and tried to come up with a rather really pragmatic uh, framework how the energy sector can help to find a solution uh, uh, here. Now, first of all, we have divided the countries into three different groups, OECD countries, uh, uh, first of all, then other major economies, Brazil, China, Middle East, and others. And uh, the third one is rather poor countries, African countries uh, mainly, and uh, India. Three countries according to uh, historical responsibilities and economic uh, affordability. And the, our approach is, first of all, one thing very important, all OECD countries should have a target for 2020. Second, other major economies should have nation policies and measures up to 2020 and should have a target after 2020. <laughs> and the other countries, poor countries, should continue to have strong policies and measures national, such as renewables, such as efficiency and the others. One important thing here is that the global emissions, we think, need to peak around 2020. So you, you, must have, uh, you might have read in the newspapers that the, the draft uh, agreement to be presented in Copenhagen by the United Nations exactly suggests the same thing. The uh, global emissions need to peak around 2020. But how will it happen? 
how this emissions trends will change. It will not change by us giving nice presentations, nice books, and so on. It will only change if there is a financial signal. And we think our uh, numbers suggest us that we need a CO2 price in the OECD countries by $50 per ton of uh, CO2. This can only give a signal to make the right investments in the energy uh, sector. And uh, in addition to that, uh, some of the investments, sustainable energy investments in the non-OECD countries needed to be uh, supported by the OECD markets through uh, CDM and other mechanisms. So for the OECD countries, uh, two major tasks, first at home, domestic, and plus uh, through uh, 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 clean development mechanism, uh, helping uh, developing countries uh, to reduce. And the developing countries have mainly at home uh, work. Now, our approach uh, suggests that we have the reference scenario in 2020, emissions about 34.5 uh, gigaton, and in 450, they need to come 30.5 uh, gigaton roughly. And we first think that the, all the countries should make domestic policies and measures. Then there are some sector agreements, some of you may uh, heard, in the sectors where there are a few number of players, such as the aircraft manufacturers, such as the iron steel makers, such as the car manufacturers, to bring the efficiency of their uh, use to a certain uh, level. And then uh, cap and trade will play a key uh, role and all of them together would bring us to a reduction which is needed in 2020 about 3.8 gigaton, 3.8 gigaton. And such a system, of course, will change the world energy picture substantially. So substantially that it is, uh, uh, when my colleagues, when we have the numbers, uh, I was not shocked, but when they put it in a, in a chart, I was shocked that, uh, to see that the fossil fuels need to peak as a group they use in 2020. So this is a big uh, story. So it means oil, gas, and coal as a group their use need to peak around 2020. Of course, not all of them has the same uh, pattern. Coal will have to peak, uh, conversion coal use have to peak much earlier. Uh, gas use still increases, but less than the reference scenario, and oil increases very, very slightly. Today we have about, uh, we use about 85 million barrels per day of oil. You remember that in the reference scenario, I said it will go to 105 million barrels per day oil. And in a 450 context, it will be only 89 million barrels per day, only 4 million barrels per day of an increase in terms of uh, oil. And uh, what happens is that the winners are the uh, so-called zero carbon uh, technologies, namely renewables, nuclear, and later on, uh, carbon capture and storage, their share is today about 18% in the global energy mix, and it will increase substantially, almost double in the year 2030 in that context. <coughs> of course, if the oil demand is uh, significantly less, it is a good news, at least for the consumers. Why it is a good news, uh, because, uh, and what, how it happens, because there will be less uh, pressure on the markets, and as a result of that, we are uh, oil press uh, trajectories in a 450 scenario is significantly less than reference scenario. And it is the reason why Mr. Tanaka called uh, the, uh, this scenario not only 450, but uh, 450 plus uh, 150 uh, uh, scenario, because we have been avoiding to have higher oil uh, prices. Uh, again, I will come at, at the end. In many countries, the reason why uh, climate change policies are pushed, including China, is not necessarily because of the climate change reasons, but they are mainly as a result of energy security reasons. But at the end of the day, they also help to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. OPEC, what happens to OPEC? Uh, the following happens to OPEC. OPEC production still increases in a 450 context, but a bit less than the reference scenario because of the uh, manufacturers, including the lower oil uh, demand. And, but of course, for OPEC, uh, what is more important is the revenues. 
some of the colleagues may, uh, who may be involved in the negotiations know that the uh, OPEC countries are a bit uh, reluctant in terms of having an agreement in Copenhagen, mainly with the uh, argument that they are going to lose a lot of money and this money that they are going to lose need to be compensated by the uh, OECD countries. They come up with such an agreement. And we wanted to check uh, how much money OPEC is going to uh, lose and how does this argument hold. This is the, in the reference scenario with the current policies in place, no climate deal. This is the cumulative OPEC revenues about 28 trillion US dollars in between 2008 and 2030 with the current policies in place. If there is a climate deal, this will go down. This will go down and it will be only 24 trillion US dollars. Still a handsome amount of money, I would say. So about one trillion uh, per year. And of course, uh, OPEC is still losing money here. That, uh, uh, that's true. But still making good money. And we said uh, this is a good amount of money, but good is a very abstract co uh, uh, concept. We said uh, uh, we wanted to compare this with the same time period in the past, what they have been making, so that to understand how, what does it mean. And uh, when we look at the past uh, 22 years, we see that the OPEC uh, revenues, even in the 450 context, is rather uh, uh, increasing. And uh, we therefore hope to see that the uh, OPEC uh, governments uh, do also uh, play their constructive role in being a part of the solution in this very important international policy uh, uh, question. Natural gas, uh, in terms of natural gas, natural gas demand uh, still increases in a, a 450 scenario context, but significantly less than the uh, reference scenario. Because in many countries, the share of uh, natural gas is going to be eaten by nuclear, by renewables, and a lot of efficiency improvements in the uh, reference scenario would mean, especially electricity side, would mean building less electricity power plants, which means building less gas-fired power plants. So, but this picture changes on a country-by-country -country basis. For US and China, we see a gas demand uh, to be uh, stronger in the 450 context. The, when we look at the CO2 emission reductions, we see three major uh, uh, areas in addition to efficiency. Efficiency is the most important uh, policy, about uh, two-thirds of the improvement uh, in the reducing CO2 emissions come from efficiency, and followed by renewables, uh, nuclear, and uh, after uh, that, after 2020, perhaps in increasing terms from carbon capture and storage. And this would all this uh, changes, having uh, uh, changes in the efficiency, renewables, nuclear, carbon capture and storage worldwide would mean we need about 10.5 trillion US dollar additional investments to come those uh, uh, levels. In terms of countries, there are six countries which are very important in this game. As Mr. Tanaka said, this year we made the analysis on a country by country basis. And these are uh, China, US, Europe, India, Russia, and Japan. Now, US, uh, US reduction uh, proposal of 18%, uh, 17% is very close what we uh, suggested uh, uh, coming from analysis, which is about 18%, but ours is uh, uh, domestic, uh, one mainly. Uh, Russia, for example, said 25%, uh, we come up with 27%. But the most important country I wanted to mention here is China. China is a very important story. What we have done for China is today, a Chinese government have a lot of policies in mind, uh, targets for 2020, in terms of the renewables. For example, I would have in 2020, share of uh, wind from uh, this bring to that. In terms of nuclear power, I will increase the nuclear power capacity from this to that. 
the hydro power in 2020, I will have 300 gigawatts. I will have efficiency improvements in the buildings from this to that. So many, many uh, targets. And these targets are not necessarily driven by climate change concerns, and they were already there before the climate change debate was already very, very hot. So it was, they were there uh, almost a year ago. And we have calculated if China reaches those targets that they put themselves, mainly as a result of energy security reasons, what happens? What we have found out that China, if they reach those targets, will uh, reduce emissions by one gigaton, around one gigaton. And this is a very big amount of reduction when you look at the global reduction needed about, uh, as I told you, uh, 3.8 gigaton in 2020, and one gigaton would come only from China if they reach their targets. Of course, there's an if here, if they reach their targets. And uh, recently announced Chinese target uh, for CO2 intensity was between 40 to 45 percent. And if we assume uh, it is 45 percent, we want to assume that as well. Uh, it is very close to our uh, 47 percent uh, target uh, uh, improvement, what, what we suggest here. One gigaton would be uh, around 47 percent, very close to uh, what we suggest. But of course, we are not sure if China is going to reach that target. But looking at the past uh, examples, China setting a target and reaching, their record track is very, very good, if not excellent. I show you the picture of India, Sub-Saharan Africa having no access to electricity. China, in 11 years, brought electricity to about 500 million people, half a billion people in, in 10, 11 years. And they didn't talk about the cost and benefit analysis markets, and they just decided and went frontal and brought electricity. They had uh, other areas, the population uh, growth control. They had suggestions, they had a target, they reached it. GDP, GDP growth targets, they always reached those targets. So again, one shouldn't be surprised if China reaches those targets and will be a major champion in fighting against climate change if they reach those targets. United States. I want to a bit speed up in terms of United States. We think the, again, efficiency, renewable uh, nu uh, biofuels, especially second generation nuclear and CCS, can play an important uh, role in reducing the uh, U.S. CO2 emissions. Two sectors in the United States, I will mention this and then uh, pass the uh, floor to uh, Ambassador Jones for concluding uh, remarks. In the electricity generation, uh, the uh, couple of things are happening. The gas will play a much important role in the U.S. Today, uh, my colleagues from EIA would know better than me, but I think we have about 330 gigawatt of coal-fired power plants, and significant amount of those power plants, coal-fired power plants, will be retiring uh, uh, sometime in the in, uh, next uh, years to come, uh, 10 years plus, and there is an important chance that those uh, power plants uh, to be replaced by uh, gas, an important uh, opportunity there. Renewables will play an important uh, role, uh, we believe. Out of the investments here, if we assume that the, uh, in the 450, in U.S. electricity generation, we will invest about 100 uh, U.S. dollar between 2008 and 2030, about 52 uh, dollar needs to go for renewable energies. Uh, Lots of renewable energy we need, and they are capital intensive. <laughs> Finally, we think if we want to come to 450, if we want to change the oil demand trends, there should be a major change in the uh, car uh, uh, sales uh, or the transportation sector. According to our numbers today, uh, one out of 100 cars sold in the United States uh, is uh, either uh, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or uh, electric vehicles. If we want to come, if we want to come to a 450 context, according to our analysis, uh, in 2030, out of 100 cars sold, 60 need to be from advanced technologies. And this is a tall order. Not the fleet, but of the sales uh, need to come from there. And I can tell you again, in China, for example, um, uh, some of you uh, uh, may well know better than me, there is a huge program on electrical vehicles. In Europe, French government is putting subsidies there. 
German government again. In Japan, uh, uh, there's a strong uh, uh, push in that direction. So what would happen, one, again, an additional aspect of this, uh, in addition to bring the CO2 emissions down, the current current U.S. Uh, uh, oil demand, which is 18.5, will go around 13.5 uh, 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 million barrels per day, a substantial decline. So this will, again, in addition to re reducing CO2 emissions, an additional benefit, a co-benefit, as they say in the climate change jargon, in order to uh, uh, bring the uh, oil uh, demand down and being less uh, relying on uh, oil imports from outside. Now, perhaps I can now ask uh, Ambassador Jones for the uh, concluding uh, uh, remarks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That's our story, and we're going to stick to it. Uh, you've probably heard it for a few, uh, uh, a few years now, but uh, we think we need to continue it. Uh, basically, what Fatih is telling you is that we need a revolution. We need to change our energy system, the entire system, because the current system is just not sustainable. Uh, even if you believe that we can find six Saudi Arabias, four to replace and two to expand demand, um, if you look at the analysis, you, the production is going to come for ever fewer countries, and many of them will be OPEC countries. So uh, from our perspective, this increases the probability of a disruption in the supply. So it's not sustainable from a security standpoint. We don't think the system is sustainable from an economic standpoint. Fatih talked about the role that uh, price volatility may have played in the, in the financial uh, crisis. Uh, we think price volatility will continue because it's going to be very hard to have much spare capacity in this system. It's going to be really stressed. Uh, in, the, in the reference scenario. And finally, uh, and we put a lot of emphasis on this, we don't think it's sustainable from an environmental standpoint. Whether or not you believe in global warming, uh, I think everyone will agree that there's a lot of environmental degradation going on now, deforestation, pollution, and so on. And those uh, aspects uh, will always be with us as long as we're such tremendous consumers of oil and gas. So whatever way you slice it, we think we need a new, uh, a new path. Now again, uh, we've, we've prepared a, a possible alternate path. Uh, it's not, uh, not the only path, uh, but we think it's a good path because it's designed to be least cost. Uh, we think it's based on reasonable policy assumptions. But of course, the actual policies will only be determined by individual governments uh, and uh, probably through negotiation. In that regard, we think that the Copenhagen meetings, which will be starting next week, or is it this weekend? I forget. But anyway, very, very soon, uh, are extremely important. They're an opportunity for the world to choose a different path. And we all hope that they succeed. And of course, I think some of the announcements made this week are uh, helping uh, increase that likelihood. Uh, but not all of the announcements made this week. Uh, so there have been some that were disappointing. But the issue is we need to start acting now. And so whether or not Copenhagen succeeds, people need to start thinking how we can change this system. And for that reason, the IEA has designed our program of work uh, to complement the results or the possible results from Copenhagen. But we believe our work will stand on its own whether or not there is a good result from Copenhagen. So they will be complementary if there is one. But if there isn't one, we think it will still be something that we should do, and we will continue to do it. Um, work like the World Energy Outlook, work like our, our policy analysis, our market analysis. We do regular uh, analyses of the oil and gas markets, regular reports. Our work on energy efficiency, we've prepared in the past 25 recommendations uh, for the uh, G8 countries. Uh, we've expanded them to our own membership and are popularizing them around the world as best we can. We're supporting the new International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Cooperation, which is a G8 plus G5 initiative. Uh, so we're doing a lot already. But I want to call your attention today to three sp uh, specific issue or initiatives that have come out of our recent ministerial meeting, which was held in the middle of October of this year. Uh, the first is a training and capacity 
building project. The IEA has done training for a long time. We train people in statistics, we train people in policy analysis, uh, modeling, and, uh, and so on. But it's always been a kind of a hit or miss affair. Uh, somebody talks to somebody and says, I have some people that need training, and we set up a little training course. And, or maybe somebody says, I've got a promising statistician. Can I send him to the IA to work, work with you for six months to learn something? And, we, and we've always accepted the, those offers when, whenever resources are allowed. Uh, but finally, at this ministerial, we actually got approval from our ministers to formalize this program. And we're going to be, in fact, we've already started it. We had our first training course a few weeks ago in Paris. We had 21 uh, Indonesian statisticians coming uh, to learn how to uh, use templates uh, for collecting data so that their data can be compatible with IEA data. And they were joined by one Ghanaian, which uh, was an interesting uh, departure for us. But it shows that the demand is out there. People do want uh, the kind of training that the IEA has to offer. And believe me, it's important because you cannot make good policy unless you know what your situation is. So the data is quite mundane, but one of the reasons we're able to stand up here today and, and, and present these kinds of results is because the IEA is the data storehouse for the world on energy. Well, but we can always improve our, our data, and one way to do it is to get better data from non-member countries, and that's exactly what we're going to be trying to do with this uh, training and capacity building program. In the end, we want people around the world to be able to do this kind of analysis for themselves because we think that the only way that people will really believe you and really make changes in their policies is if they're doing the analysis themselve, uh, themselves, and we want to help them learn how to do that. As part of this effort, we, another initiative that was launched by our ministers is a partnership initiative where the IEA is going to be working more and more with non-member countries around the world. This last ministerial meeting, by the way, we invited for the first time China, India, and Russia. All those countries had come uh, in the past individually, but none of it, they had never come as a group. I'm not saying they were a group, but they came all at the same time. And that was a, a, a real departure for us, having ministers from those countries involved. But we want to expand on that work, and we have a, a green light from our ministers to have a bigger meeting uh, this coming year. Uh, we may have up to 14 or 15 uh, non-member countries getting all together as a group to discuss our problems and hopefully discuss how we can implement Copenhagen because remember that 60 percent of the emissions problem in the world comes from the energy sector. So we're part of the problem. We have to be, be a part of the solution. The final area that it's a new initiative that was approved by the ministers is a technology platform. What FATI has, has, has described really is a technology revolution as much as anything else. And uh, we want to do what we can to help accelerate the spread of technologies around the world. And we have uh, a, approval for this, uh, what we call a platform. It's really, it will really be a series of meetings. But the idea is to help countries around the world understand how to, how to analyze not only what technologies they need, but what it takes to deploy those technologies, whether it be uh, how to overcome the barriers to deployment in their country, whether it be a financial barrier or a policy barrier, a regulatory barrier, and so on. And we think that we can work with countries around the world to help them uh, design uh, strategic energy technology plans that draw on the technology roadmaps that the IEA has been preparing for several years now so that they can understand what they need and how to get it so that they can accelerate the, uh, the transformation. Uh, this is all not, this is, none of this is going to be easy. Uh, we don't even think the uh, reference scenario is easy. It requires over $25 trillion of investment. Uh, uh, but it leads to what are a lot of uh, unpalatable uh, conclusions. So we've developed the, this 450 alternative. As I say, it's only one of many possible alternatives. But we think it's, a, it's an important one. And uh, it's, uh, it's not going to be easy. But the alternative to this scenario is worse. Because if these scenarios break down, they break down because we're assuming economic growth at 3.1 percent per year. But if we don't get economic growth, we're going to have problems, big problems, maybe worse problems than as hard as this is. Because for the very simple reason that we know already the people that will need jobs in, two, in 2030, because they're already here on the planet, they're already born. 
and we know it's a large number of people. We know that we have to continue, because of past population growth, we have to continue economic growth to provide jobs for these people. If we don't provide the energy for them, there won't be the growth. If there's not the growth, there's going to be a lot of turmoil on this planet. So for our own security, we need to pursue this. I've been, I spent most of my life working on national security, and I don't think I changed professions by moving to this job. And one of the, one of the big things that, that Fatih mentioned that we're also going to be looking at is this whole idea of universal access to electricity. $35 billion is not a lot of money when you're considering it is going to impact on over a billion people. And also, if you consider that there are five or six billion people that have access to electricity, if those people purchasing electricity just paid a few dollars more per year, we could provide a lot of electricity for the uh, poor countries in the world. And after all, those countries don't, the, the, the poor people, they need energy, but they're not going to use a lot of it. A lot of them will just use it for light bulbs so their kids can read at night and things like that. Maybe so they can watch a television or something. Uh, we think getting universal access to, to electricity will help the world a lot, and we're going to start uh, uh, fighting for that as well. So thank you very much for coming, and I guess for now we have an opportunity for some questions. Thanks, David. Well, thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm sure you've uh, provoked a number of questions. I'll stand up here because I found that when I sit down there, I can't see that side of the room, and uh, maybe that's a good thing, but I, I would like to at least give everybody the opportunity. Before we get started, though, um, uh, Dick, you, you touched on the question I was going to raise, and normally in your presentation, you'll have a chart that talks about the investment figures for, and I noticed it wasn't in at this time, so you mentioned, I think, $26 trillion for the reference case, but what is the 450 scenario? What's the increment? And uh, any of you, obviously. Uh, it, it's, it costs about $10.5 trillion more, so it's about $37 trillion. But you get a saving of nearly $9 trillion in fuel costs. You also get a, a big savings in terms of uh, human welfare. Okay, so the ground rules and questions here are normally if you can state your name and affiliation and put it in the form of a question, even if it comes at the end of a long comment, uh, we would appreciate that. So if I can start back in the back there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tom Doggett with Reuters. Uh, my question is, um, given that the global economy is still recovering, uh, do you think that uh, OPEC should increase oil output at this time when it meets December 22nd? And if it doesn't increase output, do you think global oil inventories are adequate enough to meet uh, global demand through the winter? Yes, I think, uh, uh, well, we don't have any position to, uh, uh, to ask OPEC to produce more. Um, they have to decide themselves. Um, but uh, as our well, uh, oil market report, which is coming, by the way, uh, to the end of this week, a new one, uh, so we d I don't have the number exactly for that, but uh, it depends on the how robust our economic recovery globally is. If the economic recovery is uh, as, as very strong, then uh, we need more uh, oil. Um, on the other hand, if it's not the case, we don't. I mean, at the current, uh, let's say, uh, we have revised slightly upward uh, last month for the uh, oil demand and supply <coughs> situation. And uh, call on OPEC, that's a number which uh, means the necessary production uh, from the OPEC and adjustment of the inventory is almost stable. So that means, uh, and also we expect very high spare capacity of the OPEC uh, countries uh, in the next year. Um, that means uh, at this moment, uh, we think uh, the market is very well supplied and uh, stock level is a very comfortable one. To your question. Uh, to your, oh, first to your left and then. <laughs> Don't argue. Thank you. So we were <laughs> India Global Asia today. Um, my question is that the global eyes are on India and China, and Copenhagen and President uh, Obama might be there, including the Navy Indian Prime Minister. Now, Indian Prime Minister was here last week, and they had some agreement on energy, and India is facing a big energy, as you said, also here. 
population is growing, energy is going down. So what suggestion do you think you have for India uh, to solve the energy problem and how the US and India can work on this? And what do you think the Prime Minister's visit here achieved anything? And, and actually, before you get into that, I was uh, in the context of India, I was interested in the grouping of three countries that India, which is normally linked with China in almost all debates, you had put into the lower group of countries and um, was wondering if you could also sort of elaborate on that as a, the rationale. Yeah, well, that, that exactly, uh, David, thank you for, uh, for clarification. Exactly, that is the reason why uh, we put uh, the India in the third category because in our uh, cal calculation, India's per capita GDP will not reach uh, $13,000 uh, uh, 13, uh, per capita even in, 20, even in 2030. Um, so we think uh, India cannot be categorized as other emerging economies like China and uh, these countries are supposed to uh, get into the cap and trade in, in 2020 uh, on. So India, uh, uh, say, of course, uh, India should do uh, for, their, for its own sake the energy efficiency measures in the national uh, uh, actions uh, uh, because that's good for India. But uh, certainly, uh, the trajectory of uh, CO2 emission will not peak uh, even towards 2030. So for us, that we have close uh, cooperation with India, um, and uh, our uh, strong recommendation for the energy security or en uh, this climate change is, yes, to solidify the power grid uh, and investment into the power sector. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, energy efficiency has a lots of uh, let's say, uh, benefits for, 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 for India. And I think India, uh, we are working very closely with Indian uh, power ministry. And uh, they have uh, created and working closely with us uh, for that direction. May I just add something here? The, in fact, these two. Uh, the questions of David and uh, the gentlemen, uh, the question are very much complementary. Since uh, about 40 percent of India has no access to electricity and India is already on a poor situation, it is the reason why we didn't put India and China in the same category, we didn't want to give the same responsibility, which is expressed, as Mr. Tanaka said, in terms of the GDP uh, uh, um, per capita uh, levels. But having said that, for India as well, there is a need, pressing need, to put its energy system on a sustainable uh, front uh, and uh, try to give a hand to the rather uh, positive mood in the uh, going to the climate change negotiation in Copenhagen. We uh, saw that China announced up to 45 uh, percent uh, CO2 intensity improvement, which is close to what we have. But uh, uh, what we read today in the newspapers about uh, what India may come up, and we hope they are not uh, the, 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 the final ones, are not in line with uh, what we thought India could do uh, to put it under the, uh, on the, uh, on the records. Thank you. And then. I'm Mitzi. Is this on? I'm Mitzi Wertheim, and I run something called the Energy Conversation, which we started here in town back in March of 06 to start educating people across government and anybody who wanted to come learn. Um, I want to look at this from the other end, which is the consumer. And my question is, how do you get the rest of the folks to recognize it's their responsibility to cut back? There's such a desire for growth on one end, and what you're saying, we need to keep growing, but oh, by the way, you need to use less. How do you tell that story in a convincing way that people think, yes, that's my responsibility? And I think telling story, I think how you frame the story and how you tell it is a very difficult challenge and takes lots of talented people. So what's your, what's your part <laughs> in this? <laughs> I'll let it be their part. So. Yeah, we, we, we need to be educated also, as you say. 
Um, but best way for the uh, consumers uh, to, to learn is the message from the market in terms of the price level. And we are saying clearly that uh, cheap energy age is over. And uh, if the reference, if the no business, as, uh, if the business as usual scenario continues, the price is getting $190 per barrel of uh, oil. And uh, certainly this is not sustainable. And we think that uh, even with the uh, 450 scenario, the oil price could be around $150 per barrel. But on top of that, the carbon price, CO2 price is $110 per ton of CO2, means about $40, $50 per barrel. That seems, I mean, it, it, uh, on top of $150 means the price level for consumer are the same. The difference is uh, the producer price. The producer price is much lower in the 450 scenario compared to the reference scenario. So the high price, the who takes the rent is a difference. So for the consumer countries, yes, the message from the, by these prices push us to conserve energy and be more efficient and ch even possibly changing the lifestyle. And in our World Energy Outlook, but also in our midterm oil market report, we think the last year's $147 per barrel of oil is changing the structure of demand here in this country. Sadly, I mean, it is shocking, but two major auto company collapsed last year. Certainly, it's a great evidence that destruction of demand is happening. And that is, I think, that uh, it's a clear evidence that consumer is learning. And uh, time? well, it's already happening. And uh, I think now the, let's say, uh, hybrid car is so popular, smaller <laughs> car is popular. We are start using the public transportation. I think the price signal is so strong. Um, and we are, for example, for India, we are uh, prescribing phase out the subsidy, the price control. That is a necessary, but politically not so attractive option mm -hmm. to, uh, let's say, for the consumers. In, in addition to that, though, uh, we are uh, trying to get the message out that there are alternatives. I mean, that's what the 450 scenario is about in a way. Uh, but we, we are really preaching energy efficiency because in energy efficiency you, you can find there are many ways to, to skin a cat. And you can have, in many cases, you can have the same lifestyle. You can keep your buildings warm and use less energy. And what we're trying to do is educate people and, uh, and show them the way to do that. Uh, we do it through forums like this where we talk to people. For the first time this fall, we're going to have a public uh, service announcement uh, on CNN. Uh, we're going to... Uh, uh, be promoting energy efficiency and directing people to our website. And so we're working at more in public outreach as well as the policy advice we give our governments. Let me also say something wise about this. Uh, <laughs> it's a very philosophical question you raised. Let me put it this way. It doesn't, if a person builds a coal-fired power plant, a dirty coal-fired power plant, it doesn't mean that he's a bad person. And it doesn't mean that if somebody builds a solar power plant, he's a, he's a good person. <laughs> uh, they are both driven by uh, the profit. So if there is a signal, and human beings unfortunately motivated by profit and money, the financial things, there are other, other things, at least most of them, I should say, if we want to change the habits, the ways how we use energy, how we produce energy, there is a need for a carbon price. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work through our beautiful presentations, beautiful books, and all of these things. There is a need for a signal, which I think should be a, a price signal. It's a, this is important. Thank you. Spoken like a true chief economist. Um, <laughs> we'll take one here and then one over on this side. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Mark Finley with BP. I'd like to start by thanking you all and your teams for, for producing such a great product every year. Um, I, I noticed that the reductions in the 450 case uh, by region didn't necessarily map against where the emissions or the economic activity is perfectly. Uh, and given that there, there's not a perfect match, how do you all decide where are the most cost-effective reductions to be had? If 
I may sneak one more question in. Um, I, I, given the focus on data, I'd love to hear your your views on, on what's worked and where there might be room for improvement in the data gathering initiatives you already have in place, for example, the Joint Oil Data Initiative. Thank you. So perhaps I take the first question and the uh, Jody question. I may, uh, if you wish, I can uh, pass it to Mr. Taneko, Ambassador Jones. <laughs> um, now, in terms of the, uh, the potential, it is uh, very simple. We have uh, first looked at the announced domestic policies and measures in OECD and non-OECD countries. This is regardless of the cost. There are already the policies established in China, in India, in, in, in the in European Union, I don't know, in Japan, and many countries, these are done, and we took them out of the required reductions, whatever the uh, amount is. And then we had the sectoral agreements which are taking place in different sectors, and they are going to reduce some emissions. We took them out. And when it comes to rest in the OECD and non-OECD countries, we look at the so-called marginal abatement cost curves in the, both in, in households, in transportation, and in industrial sector, and so <coughs> where it makes the most uh, who, where the uh, emission reduction should take place. However, I want to tell uh, something which I think is important to note here. And uh, I am not a negotiator, but I think negotiators uh, have make one mistake, namely, Bulk of the discussion now takes place, because it is related to Mark's question. Bulk of the discussion now takes place, which country is reduced how much, how many tons of uh, CO2 emissions? I think this is wrong as it stays alone, if it is just like that. I think more important question is, again linking to uh, Mark's question, uh, of the CO2 emissions, how much of the uh, investment needs to be paid by whom? Namely, in a country X, it may be a developing country, there may be significant amount of reductions of emissions, but if it is financed or co-financed by an OECD country, for whom it is cheaper to uh, mitigate in that country rather than at home, there is no problem. Why shouldn't the reduction uh, uh, shouldn't take place in a developing country where it is cheaper if it is co-financed or financed by an OECD country for whom it is also cheaper to do it. It is a win-win situation. Therefore, this is the message that we are trying to give the, the uh, negotiator, and we are at least partially uh, successful. The issue is who pays for the emission reduction of the total amount, how much, rather than not only focusing on the, the CO2 emission reductions itself. For the Jody, shall I say something, Mr. Tanaka, or? Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you very much. So Mr. Right. Tanaka always gives me the. So uh, Jody is, a, of course, an initiative which, has, uh, which started with very good uh, uh, intentions, and many international organizations have uh, 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 provided help there. And uh, compared to the, uh, the day we started this work, uh, there is a very significant improvement uh, having said that, uh, we also see some uh, resistance in some countries to uh, provide better data, better quality data and uh, timely data, and uh, we cannot say that uh, we reached the, uh, the target that we wanted to be as of today. Okay, why don't we gather up a couple of questions, um, and then that will allow you guys to think about them and sort of answer them uh, appropriately. So we've got one here, Carmen, and then so if we can do those three. Mikhail Kurchemkin, East European Gas Analysis. Uh, I like the section about natural gas, it's really exciting. And I have a question. Can traditional producers of natural gas, of conventional natural gas, survive through the period of gas glut? They are building LNG plants, building new pipelines that will be loaded maybe at 40, 50 percent. So instead of um, generating profits, these investments would uh, result in loss. So it's really tough. The, my point is that producers of unconventional gas have different future from that of <coughs> traditional producers. Thank you. Okay, good. Carmen, do you want to? Uh, yes. Oh, which, uh, yeah, okay. 
Um, I was wondering about the price trajectory of, uh, I'm Carmen DeFilio right. of the U.S. Department of Energy, of the uh, uh, oil price outlook and the comparison with the midterm outlook. Uh, are they consistent with each other? It seems that the message we hear today is a little bit different than June 30th with uh, Mr. Tanaka and uh, David Fife were here. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's a change in thinking or a change in data. Okay. And then one more question, and then uh, that will uh, give you plenty to work on. Thank you. Flint Leverett, New America Foundation. Good to see all of you. Um, I had a question picking up on, on Dr. Birol's, um, uh discussion of the impact of the unconventional gas revolution in the United States. We, we anticipate this gas flood looking out to, say, 2015, but then if you look longer term, uh, particularly the slide about uh, need for bringing new gas fields online, it looks like there really is a daunting supply challenge over the longer term. If you play those two, the, both the short-term scenario and the longer-term scenario, if you try and integrate those and, and look out through them over time, what does that do to the structure of the gas market? Does it become even more regionalized than it is today? Or are there some dynamics there which could encourage um, some evolution toward a more, more integrated international market for natural gas? Thank you. John. Okay. Um, in fact, the, f uh, the f uh, first question and the third question are uh, very uh, similar, but uh, perhaps I should say something which I should have said uh, before. There are colleagues here in the, in the audience who gave us a hand uh, uh, to bring this, uh, put this book together, such as uh, Guy Caruso, Carmen Difiglio, Mr. Levet, who just asked the question, Herman Franz uh, over there, and some others uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, are uh, left. Now, uh, the, to be honest with you, the, uh, I, nowadays I wouldn't like to be a traditional gas supplier. It is a bit of a schizophrenic situation uh, that, that coming to the third question because on, on one hand, to be, to be, uh, to be ready, for the, uh, ready for the exporting gas or making more use of gas after 2015, you have to invest for those fields and today nobody needs gas. So there is a bit of a schizophrenic situation here, and this is a major problem. And if I was a, a major gas exporter, uh, I, would, uh, be, I would need to be strongly convinced that it is definitely after 2015 they will uh, need my gas. Because there is one uncertainty here. We say 2015, but uh, there are two aspects. It may be even beyond 2015, to be honest with you. One, if the economic growth is slower than we expect, therefore the gas demand will be uh, uh, gas demand will be lower. This is one. Then 2015 can be postponed. And second, we say 2015, but it is in the reference scenario. If there is a climate deal, in some cases, in some countries, uh, renewables may uh, make a stronger boom than we expect, and this may also eat up uh, the uh, the gas uh, share. So it may be even earlier, but. At the same time, there is uncertainty that if the economic growth is very strong, then the gas demand may go up and the gas glut may be eaten uh, earlier. So it's a, the name of the uh, game is big uncertainty for the uh, major gas exporters. And I can understand that many gas exporters are now today frustrated, frustrated deeply with the, uh, with the uh, current uh, situation. And even when they look at the next one or two years, it is even uh, uh, worse for them. So, uh, and the question is, of course, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, the story is completely different for the unconventional uh, uh, gas supplies, especially in the uh, United States. They have their own challenges, but different than the challenge that we have uh, stated for the uh, traditional uh, 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 gas suppliers. Now, what happens after 2015? My, uh, my, my, it is very difficult to guess, but my guess is there needs to be a, a weakening between the uh, oil and gas prices in the long-term contracts. This is where we have to go. Otherwise, the, it will not be fair to anybody, to be honest with you, and there will be more divergence between the uh, gas world and the realities of the life, so to be honest, uh, to, to, be, to, be, to be fair. Uh, but we still, in many cases, link long-term contracts, but perhaps long-term contracts can be formulated in different contexts than we have been uh, doing uh, uh, up to now. 
and uh, and I think the what will happen is the hands of the in general terms hands of the buyers will be stronger in the next years to come vis-a-vis -vis the hands of the uh, uh, the uh, exporters. Now, uh, uh, Carmen's question: uh, Our uh, our price assumptions here are significantly different than the uh, uh, the Mr. T uh, Mr. Tanaka's presented. Uh, Midterm outlook; they are significantly uh, higher than that. Those uh, that work has been done during the financial crisis, where we uh, and others thought that the uh, the, uh, the economic uh, crisis would be much deeper and continue much longer. Therefore, the demand will be much more weaker. Therefore, therefore we had lower prices uh, there. But in the uh, world energy outlook we presented today, as Carmen uh, noticed, uh, we have significantly higher uh, price levels. So I think we have time for one last round of questions. So have uh, okay, one in the back. Why don't you go ahead? And others uh, over here, and then one in the back. So. Okay. Thank you. My name is Frau Gatis from the World Watch Institute. I have a question regarding the technology mix in the 450 scenario. Because you're putting a lot of emphasis on nuclear energy and carbon capture and storage. And then if we look at just the development last year, for example, where wind was the single most installed capacity in both the US and Europe, and also renewables together made up more, at least in Europe, than all the other technologies together. So I wonder which assumption these, or which basis these assumptions are based on, that um, CCS and nuclear would make up such a large share. And then the second question is, given that we don't know yet when CCS will become available and whether it will become available on a large scale and economically viable, what is the risk in using this technology and can we bear this risk and what are the alternatives? Okay. Bob. Bob McNally with the Rapidan Group. Uh, given how the shale gas has snuck up on us here in the United States, uh, not because we found shale, but we realized we could produce it economically with hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. Fatih, could you please venture a guess as to how much shale we're going to find that can be produced, produced economically in the next few years? Any, any rough estimate of what increase in, in reserves we could expect globally? And then elaborate a little bit on the environmental challenges to producing that gas, especially in densely populated areas such as the Marcellus or Europe. Thank you. And then the, the last question. Ian Talley, Dow Jones. Uh, you included CCS in your projections. Um, I, I'm curious about to what extent you uh, included that CCS in uh, China's uh, co-fired post-combustion um, uh, capture. Uh, it seems that much of their uh, their emission growth, I think, is almost doubling, is based on uh, their their coal-fired uh, power use. And I'm wondering if you have adequately compensated uh, for for their your uh, projections there. For the first question, I mean. Um, CCS and nuclear and uh, renewables, uh, we, we think these three options are necessary. Um, we, we are, uh, let's say, in different countries, in, in, in what uh, Fadi explained, uh, this is a uh, U.S. case, and the nuclear is certainly uh, is a very uh, important part, and CCS coming after the 2020. I mean, globally speaking, yes, wind and renewables certainly is a very important option. Um, to, uh, I think we have the numbers uh, that, but uh, you know, uh, it's if wind or other renewables are not available, certainly CCS must happen. If CCS does cannot happen, yes, we need more nuclear. So all these three are related, and uh, sometimes we are uh, criticized that okay, wind. Our assumption of wind is too low. We could have much more. That's what the wind pr uh, mill producers are uh, okay. telling us. Fine. If that's the case, we have less CCS or less nuclear. But if it doesn't happen, we need uh, nuclear CCS. <laughs> and next year, we are going to publicize so-called energy technology perspective. So we are making a little more, the, let's say, cases rather than just simple one scenario like 450. We could have higher renewable cases, for example. 
And what, the cost it, what does it cost mean? It could cost more than the 450. So, so by doing so, the kind of sensitivity analysis we will try to do next year. CCS in China, yes, certainly that is a very important part of uh, the solution. And uh, uh, in China, we make a presentation that uh, the coal power plant, uh, a major part of the coal power plant should have CCS. Otherwise, uh, this 450 cannot uh, really happen. And uh, technology roadmaps, which we are developing, uh, certainly uh, call for not only 20 CCS demonstration proje uh, pro project, but 100 project in 20, 2020, 840 project in 2030, and even 3,400 project in 2050. That's the magnitude of the CCS uh, necessary to make this 450 scenario possible in the future. And, uh, the later, I mean, at the beginning, like 2020 to 2030, yes, certainly this deployment of CCS be in the developed country, but after 2020, yes, the, uh, our 2030, much more, uh, uh, I would say, CCS must be deployed for the emerging economy like China. Otherwise, uh, simply, uh, I would say, uh, carbon mitigation is a scientific fiction. For Gas, yes. yeah, yeah, gas, and uh, uh, first of all, uh, just cross one, one remark uh, uh, to the uh, uh, lady over there. If we don't have CCS and nuclear, believe me, renewable cannot save the world alone. That is, we need definitely some other things and uh, zero emission technologies. Efficiency and renewables are the top two policies which would help us. But we need others uh, there, especially nuclear as a base load uh, electricity generation technology is a key uh, t technology here. We don't have the luxury to categorically uh, leave out nuclear uh, uh, from the uh, picture and about CCS, Mr. Tanaka already uh, 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 mentioned. But again, CCS is, you are right, different than renewables and nuclear. It is not yet a fully proven technology such as renewable and nuclear, we still need to see CCS uh, to uh, address the challenges of uh, economics, technology, and uh, uh, regulation, but we are working on that. In terms of the, uh, the contribution of the uh, unconventional gas worldwide uh, to the uh, global uh, gas production, it is very, very difficult, but our wildest estimate, as you will see in our book, it can go up to, in, to in 2030, up to 10% of the global gas production, up to 2030 of the global gas production. But I hope we are uh, wrong and it is uh, higher. As I told you, in many basins throughout the world, there is a very strong uh, interest in many countries. And in all of these countries, not only the countries, national oil companies, gas companies are working, but many companies who have already gained experience in the United States and elsewhere are uh, showing interest in terms of uh, uh, financial interest, in terms of exposure activity in uh, Asia and in, in Europe. Thank you. Well, I think we've run out of time, so I, I want to thank you all for coming and doing this presentation. I think it's very interesting to be in this world where we have a much more positive forecast of $150 barrel oil and spending, was it more than $30 trillion to get to 450 But I think that's the nature of the world we're living in with energy and climate. So again, join me in thanking uh, all three of you.